And so we are able now to start again. And I think that uh, we are starting with Laura Hilly from the University of Oxford. And uh, she already contributed in many ways to the proceedings yesterday and this morning. So we know her uh, well. Uh, it is interesting because she is going to talk uh, about the United Kingdom, but also about South Africa, and then also about Australia. <laughs> and, although this was not part of the original deal, no, no. we welcome very much also your contribution to, to you. whatever you, you're going to say about Australia. We found yesterday that Australia is so interesting that it may add some new perspectives on it. So please, uh, Laura, you have 25 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you to Roberto and to Jens for inviting me. It's wonderful to be in Trento. It's my first time here, and this is a wonderful conference. Um, I put in Australia, I went beyond the brief, um, because these are the three jurisdictions that I've focused in in my doctoral research, which has looked conveniently at one of the questions that was raised in the previous session about what the substantive impact of diversity will be or could be. Um, I sp focus specifically on gender diversity as the primary lens in which to look at the broader question of diversity. But as you'll see from my presentation, um, gender alone or single axes focuses on diversity are incomplete when we're talking about the question of judicial diversity. Um, sorry. Yeah, there we go. So the points that I'm going to look at today in my 25 minutes are, first of, well, what do we mean when we talk about diversity? I think this term needs a little bit of unpacking. Um, second, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of who our judges are, um, looking at the Australian, South African, and um, English and Welsh uh, conditions, as I've been pulled up by using UK too liberally, but I do talk about UK because I look at the UK Supreme Court. Um, I'm going to say, why does it matter? The first three points were touched on so helpfully in Fred's presentation, um, but I'll quickly run through them. Power, fairness, confidence in the courts. Then the fourth point, the quality of justice, is the one that I'm going to do a close-up examination on today and use my qualitative research findings. So I did a study where I interviewed final appellate court judges from South Africa, the UK and Australia and asked both men and women judges sitting on this co these courts, how does your gendered experience impact your own decision-making processes, but also given that you're sitting on collegiate courts, how does it impact upon the collegiate environment and the collegiate discussions that happen behind the scenes when coming to outcomes? And then I'll give some final thoughts on where, where to now, and I think a lot of these are going to link nicely into what John's going to say next on conceptions of merit and appointment processes, but I will really just flag these and perhaps we can talk about them in, in the questions. So the first question is, well, what do we mean when we talk about diversity? And usually diversity has been focused upon what we usually refer to as grounds-based um, uh, indicators, drawn from discrimination law principles, which highlight um, certain groups that have experienced historical disadvantage and marginalization. We see that the, the main focus has usually been in these discussions around gender. Um, we have seen, uh, though, in the last decade or so, a greater awareness of the need to talk about what the um, English term black, Asian and ethnic minority groups or racial and ethnic diversity. We are coming to a greater awareness, though, that socioeconomic background matters as well. Um, class and status um, impact as well when we're talking about diversity. But there are other indicators or other questions that we should also keep in the back of our mind. What about sexual orientation? What about disability? What about all the other aspects of protected grounds that have historically served to exclude people or marginalise people from positions of power and decision making? And finally, the final dot point on that, under that first heading is about intersectionality of multiple grounds. So as I said, this paper is going to say that it's not enough just to look at diversity along a single axis lens. It's not enough to look at just gender if we want to really work out who is being marginalised and who is being excluded and whose voices aren't coming into the deliberative, uh, deliberative, pro deliberative processes that happen in judicial reasoning. 
Um, we need to look at the intersection, so the way perhaps that gender and race might intersect to um, impact upon somebody's power status in society and therefore their inclusion or not inclusion in power making forums. I also want to couple the grounds-based assessment with a richer definition of diversity. And this is one that uh, Kathy, Professor Kathy Alberton, who's at Witts University in Johannesburg, um, forwarded in a piece that she wrote last year. And she said that diversity is used to express a more complex idea of multiple judicial differences that go beyond facial group-based differences to differences in norms, values, judicial attitudes and philosophy, and the effect that these might have on the very nature of the institution, its norms, values and modes of adjudication. So this presentation today is going to look at the interaction between those two concepts of diversity. So it goes beyond just what diversity looks like. So maybe the political or the visual um, benefits that we get from having a diverse bench, but to consider what diversity does. So, so what is the substantive impact of diversity? How might it change the dialogue or change the processes upon which decision making is, is happening? So I'm going to start off with some depressing statistics, and this is once again reverting back to a single axis of analysis, so looking at sex. And so you can see here um, that we have nowhere in the world are women actually dominating across the board um, in the judiciary. Some jurisdictions have greater women's participation than others, particularly Central and Eastern European and Central Asian jurisdictions and Latin America um, and we usually find women's greater participations in civil law systems where there is a career judiciary, um, as I referred to in my comment before. But as we can see in the common law world where we're represented here, women do badly. And so why look at gender? Well, I mean, the first point is, is that women make up 50% of the world. But the point that must follow from that is, women don't just make up 50% of the world, but they have for more than 30 years now. So 2015 in the UK is the 30th anniversary of women being more than 50% of law graduates. In jurisdictions like Australia, we're now seeing women graduating at about 60% of, of recent graduates. And this isn't a recent phenomenon. There has been time for them to be elevated in the ranks to go through the profession, but they are still not here. But also, when we talk about gender, when we talk about sex, I would rather talk about gender than sex. And realizing that gender is not just about sex, but gender is about power relations. And so gender also must include a conversation and an understanding of how the identity of sex also intersects with other factors that impact your gendered relations and where you sit in the power hierarchies of society. So for example, race, class, socioeconomic background, ethnicity. So looking at our apex courts and back to looking at women again. So we can see the UK Supreme Court has one woman, one woman and 11 men. The High Court of Australia has three women and four men. So it looks like Australia might be doing better in terms of its final appellate court than other jurisdictions. The South African Constitutional Court, despite the great guarantee that was put into the Constitution 20 years ago, saying that judicial appointment needed to have regard to both gender and race, still only has two women and nine men, and that is exactly the same number of women and men that they had when the Constitutional Court first started sitting 20 years ago. So what we can see with this is that um, in the South African experience, while there has been great gains in racial transformation, these haven't necessarily been racial transformations for women. It has been preferencing black men in the transformative process and not black women. If we look at the judiciary as the whole, if we move away from the apex courts, we get some more depress depressing statistics. Um, and as what we see, these are overall statistics, but if we look down and dig down into which courts women are sitting on, we see that they are more likely to sit in lower courts. Australia, where I showed you where there are three women out of seven on the high court, but if we then look at the um, federal court, where Debbie is a member, or if we look at, um, say, the New South Wales uh, Supreme Court, um, which is one of the largest courts in the jurisdiction and uh, one of the most prominent feeder courts for the high court, we have a really, really low level of women's participation on those courts. So it's careful to like disaggregate courts and not just look at big pictures, but actually seeing where in this power hierarchy are women being allowed in um, and where are they not. But beyond looking at women, we need to look at the intersectional experiences. 
And um, these statistics from South Africa exemplify how the promise of both gender and racial transformation in the judiciary haven't come to fruition. So at the moment we see, so in South Africa there are these four categories that they use to um, use to sort of frame the language around racial diversity. They're imperfect categories and they are, um, it is difficult to sort of categorise in, in this way, but I use them simply for an analytical framework. And so we have black, coloured, Indian and white. And we see here that while black women comprise 40% of the South African population, they're only comprising 14% of the judiciary, compared to black men who comprise 40% of the South African population, but are now comprising 30% of the court. Um, so we see here that it's important not just to look at women as a homogenous whole, but to also look at other indices that might seem um, to indicate exclusion or disadvantage. The UK has similarly depressing statistics. Black, Asian, ethnic minorities make up 14% of the population. Um, and while the, South Af well, the UK doesn't actually disaggregate its data um, in terms of gender and black ethnic racial minority, the, the figures are pretty easy to calculate because it, when it comes to how many black, Asian, ethnic minority women are sitting on superior courts in this jurisdiction, there are none. There's one black man sitting in the high court and there has been one black woman who used to sit in the high court but she's now retired. Statistics, as I said, are important. And Debbie presented some figures that she got to um, yesterday on the participation of Indigenous women in the Australian judiciary. However, there is no formal mechanism of collecting any data in Australia on the participation um, along racial or ethnic minority grounds in our judiciary. So in the Australian judiciary, we actually just do not know what the composition is in terms of, um, in t in terms of um, racial and ethnic minority. So this brings me to, I guess, my first take-home point um, for anyone who might be in a law reform or policy-influencing position, that data matters. If we're going to talk about this subject, we need to know what exactly we're talking about. And to do that, we need better data collection. Statistical insignificance can lead to real-world insignificance. And this was a point that was really emphasised by an English academic, Les Moran, talking about LGBTI groups in the um, judiciary in the UK, because that, does, that data is not collected at all. So we cannot say whether there's an inclusion, over-inclusion, under-inclusion of this particular group. So in a report that was written um, last year by Karen Monaghan and Geoffrey Beinman for the UK Labour Party, um, which they were hopefully going to um, act upon should they have won the election yesterday, which they didn't, which is very depressing. Um, they did make these recommendations that we need to have better data collection. We also need to move beyond just data collection on sex. And they said, you know, we need to look at disability status, sexual orientation, religion and belief, social and educational backgrounds of judges and tribunal members. Um, these statistics should be collected published regularly and published in open and accessible format so that we can actually look at what the problem is. I would also like to add to this recommendation that we need to do more than look at these groups as a monolithic whole, but look at how they intersect within each other. So we need to know how many black, Asian, ethnic minority women are sitting in courts. Um, it's not enough just to look at as gender at a, as a monolithic whole. So after setting up that I guess, overview of the situation in terms of statistics, I say, well, why does all of this matter? Why do we care whether our courts are diverse or not? And there are four points that I elaborated in my research. Um, and as I said at the outset, I'm only going to focus on the third today, but I'll say a few quick words about the first three. The first one is about power. Who's sitting on courts? Says a lot about who gets to hold power, who's capable of hold, holding power, who deserves to hold power. It sends expressive messages about women and about other previously excluded groups in society. It sends a message about their deservingness of inclusion or not deservingness of inclusion if they're not sitting on these courts. The second point is about fairness. And as I alluded to, arguments that there is no pool from which we can appoint, particularly in relation to women, no longer holds water. It is a matter of fairness to women in the profession that we see the opportunities to be elevated um, equally to their male cohort. And whether or not they're, um, and if that is not happening, given the pool that is available, points to indirect discrimination or even direct discrimination operating in the appointment system. The third point is public confidence in the courts. And this was a point that we talked about a lot yesterday in terms of legitimacy. 
So what it says about our institutions, can we have faith in them um, if, they are, if they are exclusive um, and the domain of one particular group in society? And that public confidence issue, I think, really um, ties in with the fourth point, which I'll focus the rest of my presentation on, being the quality of justice that courts can afford. Um, so will we have better or worse justice if we do or do not have diversity? Are we having actually impoverished courts at the moment because we don't have diverse courts? So my argument is, well, yes. At the moment, I believe that a lack of diversity impedes both the quality of justice that a court can deliver because a lack of diversity limits the perspectives that are brought to bear on judicial reasoning. I argue that a diverse court will be a stronger court primarily for two reasons in terms of what it can deliver in terms of substantive justice. It'll be a stronger court because it'll be better able to relate to the community in which it serves. And secondly, because it will have a better tool base to be able to interrogate subconscious bias or subconscious partiality that exists within its members. So the way that I have examined these questions is using a theoretical basis and a theoretical framework about experiential knowledge. This is to say that, um, that experiential knowledge is an important epistemology in judging. Just like we give weight to technical abilities, I say that we should also give weight to experiential knowledge because particularly in final appellate courts, this impacts upon the product that is produced by these courts. I draw on feminist standpoint theory that's been developed by Patricia Hill Collins, a black sociologist feminist based in the US. And the argument goes a little something like this. That we all have perspectives and that our perspectives are intimately shaped by our experiences. All of our experiences, men and women, are gendered. We have both shared gendered experiences and unique gendered experiences. And from these, this shared and unique, we create this experiential knowledge that I say is so valuable in judging. I also go on to the third point in this theory that says that there's this valuable didactic relationship between experiential knowledge and the traditional or received knowledge. As you'll see from some of the points I make later, the judging isn't only about experiential knowledge, but it's about how experiential knowledge may colour and inform the application of received knowledge. This is particularly important in common law jurisdictions where judges are not seen as just the mouthpiece of the law but have an explicit interpretive function. They need to apply precedent, distinguish precedent, interpret facts. The judge is intimately involved in the decision-making process. Query whether this is also true in civil jurisdictions because the mouthpiece of the law argument in civil law jurisdictions might actually be too easy and too convenient to maintain. So with this received knowledge and this didactic relationship, I say that this allows for a richer body of jurisprudence to develop. And being at a comparative law conference, it's nice to say to this audience who will fully understand the value of this, but in some ways, having diverse perspectives brought to bear on a question is like being a comparative lawyer, looking at something from a different experiential perspective. It allows us to see the strange and the familiar. It allows us to interrogate what we might just assume to be the right or normal or natural way of doing things by looking at the experience of others. So what I'm going to do now is just focus on the two small points, two small questions that came up in my research. And this is very particular to common law jurisdictions. But it was challenging two what I feel are barnacled assumptions about how judges judge in a modern world. The first assumption was that judging is not subjective. Judges just apply the law. And the second point is that a judge's identity does not matter. His or her gender will not impact upon the way that she or he decides a case. So as I said at the outset, I explored these questions through qualitative interview series. I have some problems with the quantitative, uh, the quantitative um, methodology that's been applied in this area that only looks at the outcome of cases. I think that this has the potential to essentialise and stereotype and also run roughshod over a lot of the difficult questions that determine how a case may be um, decided ultimately without giving enough subtlety to look at what happens behind the scenes and how um, experiential knowledge might impact upon a dialogue that may not necessarily change the outcome in a particular decision, but may change the process by which that decision is come, um, arrived at. 
So I interviewed 30 judges sitting in final appellate courts in South Africa, the UK and Australia. So namely the Constitutional Court in South Africa, the UK Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, the Australian High Court and then the Victorian Supreme Court. So I only looked at one jurisdiction um, in Australia in this, at the state level. So here's what my um, interviewees had to say, and this is the juicy bit, so this is all the gossip that I can report back to you. Um, so the first one was asking the judges, well, you know, do you just apply the law? What do you think about this sort of objective decision-making function that you perform? And here's a response from a South African judge, uh, animated for the benefit of Frank <laughs> on my slides. <laughs> I said, how much do you think that social awareness or perhaps common sense plays in the work that you do as a judge? So I use common sense and social awareness, I guess, as a proxy for this subjectivity. It was a term that is not sort of, I guess, too controversial or too difficult for my interview participants to understand, but really gets at whether or not they're engaging subjectively. And he laughed at me. And I said, well, you can't just laugh. That's not very helpful. This is my doctoral research, and I have to have some answers. And so he said, well, it's elemental. It's the start of everything, um, and it's possibly the first post and possibly even the last post. And I said, OK, and in what way? Some people would say that social awareness or common sense has nothing to do with the role of the judge, that the judge is just applying the law. And he said, that's complete nonsense. So pretty emphatic about that. Another interviewee, um, a female South African judge, sort of went more into the subtleties of this question. And she said, well, social awareness is intrinsic to the very nature of the judicial project. And you can't rule by grammar, by technical analysis, or by abstract reasoning. But judging isn't just simply applying social awareness to the problem. So here we get the didactic relationship coming through about technical and experiential. Social awareness feeds into it. It's one of the central elements of judging process, but it doesn't occupy the whole space. So it's neither an add-on to a purely technical thing, nor is it a basic canvas on which you trace a few judicial lines. Here are some more quotes which were responses to the question, well, are judges just applying the law? Um, this judge said, to the extent that the values occupy a central and often commanding place in the judicial function, social awareness becomes an imperative. In a case where the very nature of the constitutional project is transformatory, so this is clearly in the South African context, where they do see their constitution as transformatory, and without social awareness, transformation becomes rather meaningless, and then you're just struggling with abstract concepts and ideas. And here is the difference, this, this point about sort of social awareness and common sense is interesting in the collegiate system um, and in a collegiate context. So this judge really sort of interestingly pointed out that where you might think that X is common sense and you find that a colleague has grown up in a different environment or a different life experience, it's not common sense. It might be an outright lie, but it's certainly not the accepted norm. So we he see here how different perspectives might actually help improve partiality. They might help us unlock subconscious bias. So that was the first assumption. The second assumption is, well, you know, if this is a subjective exercise, does identity matter? Does it matter whether you've lived a woman's gendered life experience or a man's gendered life experience? And this quote that I've got here is from uh, Julia Gillard, the first um, female Australian Prime Minister, the only Australia, female Australian Prime Minister. And she said upon... Um, her um, exit from that position in 2013 when asked about whether her gender made any difference of her time in office. She said, it doesn't explain everything, it doesn't explain nothing, it explains some things. And I think that that's a really important quote to keep in mind when we're looking about what impact gender has upon the substantive um, uh, decision-making function. So can we use gender to predict outcomes Frank spoke to this before and gave the very sensible answer, well, no, not necessarily, and I agree, as does this interviewee, saying it's a mischaracterization to assume that a woman and a man will decide a case, uh, a woman will decide a case differently to a man. And it's dangerous to women as it is to men, because quite frankly, it assumes that you'll be deciding based on your gender, and the whole point of law is it's meant to be blind from these things, and you ought to be able to get the same result from a male judge or a female judge. So as far as it's assumed that you will get a different result or a different treatment from a man or a woman, that's problematic, and that's partly what scares the horses in these kind of debates. This, uh, another judge went in and talked about identity determinism. So this is saying that you will decide a particular way and that will be determined by your gender. 
Once again, she talks about the siren, uh, siren of identity determinism. It has the potential to stereotype and essentialize both women and men and can be quite unhelpful. I'm going to move on now to this next slide, which um, gives a nice example of how this siren of identity determinism can play out. So the first interview is with um, a male judge, and I asked him, do you think that women have a different approach to rape cases than men do? Um, and he thought that they did, and I said, well, is it because they've practiced in that area previously, or they might have greater technical expertise in rape cases? Um, and, oh, sorry, this is the female judge, and she said, you know, she thinks it's prob problematic because she's been vilified by lawyers' groups, and particularly women's groups, where she hasn't given the outcome in a particular rape sentence that the women's groups might have expected her to give because she was a woman. It puts a great burden on the shoulders of the judge to have to sort of perform not just to the case, but perform to the commentary that's going around it that are assuming that they'll decide in a certain way because of um, their gender identity. Um, but then we also get another problem, is that are judges representing that group um, when they are sitting there? Do women have to represent women? Are black judges representing the black community? Um, this judge was a South African judge, and he said, when I sit in, as, in court as a black judge, there are instances um, where there is African law, and I am in a much better position than my white counterpart. I can understand these nuances. I believe that the perspectives of living African law I didn't read it, I'm living through it, I know what I mean. Now this quotation is a difficult one and it can be interpreted in two different ways. One, it could be taken as a, um, an idea of superior knowledge on a certain um, subject matter because of your identity. I think this is problematic. This is problematic because you're not yourself letting your um, own subconscious biases be open to interrogation by your colleagues. Just because you are a black judge or just because you're a woman judge doesn't mean you know everything about black experience or women's experience. You need to still remain alive to the possibility that a colleague may have a different perspective that should inform your own. Um, but the other interpretation of this is because of his lived experiences with African law and with customary law, that it meant something more than just rules in a, on a statute or rules in the book. Um, it actually had some contextual meaning that he could then offer that experiential knowledge in interpreting. Um, so what can identity do? So the big point that I would come home to is that, well, the first important thing is that it can help unearth subconscious bias. And so subconscious bias is bias that, you know, we may not necessarily be aware of, um, but may just be our natural response to something that needs to be interrogated and can only often be interrogated until we're posed with a counter or opposing um, perspective. So this judge said here, well, you know, you learn your blind spots. Uh, you learn what your prejudices are and you learn that there are different ways of being in the world. You understand the limits of your own life experiences imposed upon you and that is hugely valuable. At times, it can be, can be quite painful to be told that your worldview is, in fact, completely erroneous worldview. And it can be quite painful, but it's really important. And that's where the real value comes. And so, speaking about diversity. And then there's a second one that is about the understanding of community. And here I want to, this is my final slide so, um, <laughs> of the quotation, so hopefully I'm not getting away from time too much. But these final two quotations that I'm going to put up show the importance of looking at um, diversity along more than just a single axis. Um, so these are both quotations from a woman, but this is a black woman judge in South Africa who grew up in an impoverished rural circumstance. And so she says um, her contribution is, well, you know, for people who have not lived in rural areas, they don't know how hard it is to find a bucket of water in your home. And if you come from that background and sometimes you go home and experience it firsthand, it's very difficult for you to explain to a person who does not have that advantage. So speaking about this different um, experience as an advantage. How difficult there are, uh, there are things, um, and I know because sometimes when I'm in my house in the suburbs and I take certain things for granted until I go home and I realize how important it is just to have a toilet that can flush. Um, the second quotation here really brings home the gendered aspect of this intersection between race uh, and socioeconomic and rural um, situation in the world. Um, and so she's talking about um, how she understands rape cases. 
And this is a particular, um, uh, you know, this is the South African context in which sexual violence, um, you know, is, is prevalent in these circumstances cannot be underestimated. And she says, well, when you grow up with girls and you're a woman yourself and you listen to your friends and how they relate to things that have happened to them and you know how scared you are sometimes from being hijacked, for instance, and I'm a woman, people would lock their houses because they don't want their possessions being taken. I would lock my house because I'm scared of being raped. And because I'm a woman, I would think of that. So here we see this intersection between her gendered and um, other aspects of her, her, her life experience intersecting to form her view and her perspectives on how she interprets in rape cases. So what we're looking at um, in these circumstances is not only about gender. We can't do away with gender altogether because gender is such a big thing, but it's also looking for the missing perspectives, looking at what perspectives have been excluded from judicial decision making and then trying to bring them in to enrich the judicial conversation. So the final points, which we won't have time to talk to um, in this presentation, but perhaps in the questions is, well, where, did it, where to now? How do we get this kind of diversity? Um, do we just wait? Well, I've already said that the, the pool argument and trickle-up theory, you know, the pool argument that there's just not enough people there, and the trickle-up theory for certain groups of women um, can, no, you know, can no longer be maintained. Um, the second point, which I won't speak that much to because I know John is going to, is should we be looking at how we look, should be reconsidering how we look at merit? Should merit also have a greater emphasis on this experiential knowledge combined with the technical knowledge? And in most judicial appointment systems, we've seen this prioritization of technical knowledge um, at the exclusion of experiential knowledge. And the final point is, well, maybe we need quotas. Um, so the Byman and Monaghan report that I referred to earlier actually made a recommendation for there being quotas in the UK um, because the political process was such at the moment and the political environment was such that nothing is happening, that we are not seeing an increase that we should see being increased. And while people can point to very small incremental um, um, increases in women's participation, when you look at that viewed against the pool argument, and there are so many more women practicing um, in the legal profession, in all areas of the legal profession, we might actually say that the situation is not getting better, it's getting worse because the levels of discrimination, both direct and indirect, are intensifying against these women in this larger pool. So if that's what I've um, spoken about today. I'll leave my concluding points up there if anyone needs an aid for questions. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura, for the presentation and also for uh, sticking to the time limits. Um, now, let, before we start the discussion, let me just point out one thing, that in Laura's presentation, diversity is presented uh, with its normative content. In other words, diversity must be there, and of course it is also interesting to find out how to get to have an increase of diversity within the, the court. And I'm also uh, grateful for mentioning the suggestion or recommendation that at least as far as the UK is concerned, or England and Wales perhaps only, uh, some quarters are required. And I, I said that I'm, I'm grateful to you for mentioning that, not because I think that it is a nonsense, but because I think that it shows the rigidity that you can get to when you frame reasoning on diversity in normative terms. I think that the court system would be very rigid, and I would say quite intrinsically rigid, and to some extent even contradictory to the idea that uh, justice is neutral and impartial. But having said that, let me just open the floor for discussion questions, opinions, and whatever. And I would continue, as we did earlier, to have two or three questions and then give the speaker the possibility of giving an answer. So we have already one, uh, two, okay, so two is enough. Three, good. It is almost like an auction, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I thought that was a really interesting presentation and, of course, it, um, it hits home quite um, closely for me in many ways. I have two questions and, and both involve a comment as well. The first is um, what you had to say about uh, the depth and quality of the pool of women from uh, which judicial selections can be made. 
um, it's my view, certainly in my jurisdiction, and I, in that sense I mean both federally and at state level in Australia, that the pool remains not as deep and not as high quality. And I would um, not agree with you that it's simply a matter of um, a refusal by the executive government to make the choices that are obviously there. Um, I think the situation about why there are not sufficient numbers of high quality female candidates for the judiciary in my jurisdiction is very complex and has to do with a lot of choices that women make in particular about the way they um, structure their professional lives uh, and it has to do with the choices of those women's partners and those women's families as well and it's um, you know the, the way that women are not filtering up to be in the position both in terms of the quality of their performance as lawyers and their experience to be in the position for judicial selection, I think it's very complicated. But certainly the pool is nowhere near as deep as it is uh, for men. That's my, that's my view. But I'm interested in what you say about that. Secondly, um, the point you made at the start about the lack of data on um, judges and their attributes, uh, I can understand um, from a researcher's point of view, the frustration for that. Can I just offer the judge's perspective on that? Personally, I would be highly resistant to somebody asking me what my sexual orientation was, or what my religious belief was, or what my socioeconomic background was. Now, my gender happens to be obvious. Um, that's actually not true of every single person in the world. Let's remember that. Um, and there's an element, again, because I guess it hits close to home because the suggestion is something that's capable of affecting me as a judge. And I'm uncomfortable about that. Now, I don't know how you reconcile the need for the data with the sensitivity of the people that you're asking the questions about, but I think it's something that needs to be considered. Yeah. Gender is considered... Uh, the microphone to, to Professor Saunders. Uh, gender is supposed to be cultural rather than biological, so... Um, yes, thanks very much, Laura. That was very interesting. Can I ask you, from a comparative point of view, I assume you asked the same questions of these various judges in the various courts. Uh, did you find that you got... Um, um, ..significantly different answers uh, to the same questions as between those three countries? Uh, and as between judges in different courts within the same country? And if so, um, how do you interpret that? One more, Alexandra. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I'd like to ask you about uh, the thing. Uh, how far can we go when we are thinking about diversity in such a rich uh, and broad sense, uh, because you have brightly demonstrated that if we will uh, think in separately about men and women, or for example, race, white, and blacks, uh, it will uh, it will, in any case, misleading for us something sometimes. But if we will think about the complexity of criteria, for example, how can we uh, check? Uh, uh, how many women are uh, of this race, of this uh, sensitive of, uh, and of uh, such or that health and from uh, middle class or from marginals. Uh, but in this situation you have some mathematic constraints because uh, concerning the uh, Supreme Courts, for example, if you have only 12 judges how you can to reflect uh, these uh, very uh, constraints in figures. That, that is my question. So uh, what is the goal? Uh, because you have demonstrated these tables, but what is the goal to, to make the percentage just equal or, or, or what? Thank you. Great. Yeah, that's a lot. Really great questions. Really difficult questions as well. Um, depth and quality of the pool. So in a 25-minute presentation, obviously it's hard when looking at three jurisdictions to go into every every question, um, sort of every jurisdiction in its actual specificity. Um, but 
I would sort of answer that question with another question. Well, how do we look at pool? And who do you think are the most highly candidates or the ones that you think are ready to be appointed? And this question is a controversial, well, this is a controversial answer to this question. But one of the arguments that put, was put forward is that often, particularly in the Australian context, when we're thinking about who's ready for judicial appointment, we're looking at who are um, um, advocates, who are QCs. Um, are there women, enough women QCs to then put up to the bench? And so my answer to that would be we need to be more creative about how we look at pool and that barristers have an important function um, <laughs> but they're not the only lawyers in the world and that um, solicitors, the appointment of academics, the appointment from people from community legal sectors, um, that we also see a professional homogeneity um, in who gets to be appointed as a judge and who doesn't get to be appointed as a judge. Um, we had a conversation yesterday obviously about the need for people with technical um, trial experience to be in trial courts, but I don't think that argument completely holds true when we get to final appellate courts. I argue that for two reasons. One, because um, not everybody on every a court will have every area of expertise at their fingertip when every area of law or every sort of manifestation of law. So you may not know the rules of evidence, but you may have a really deep substantive knowledge of um, discrimination law that might you know be superior of your colleagues and so we do have in our appointments processes a preferencing of certain technical abilities and I think that they have huge gender ramifications in what we preference as being the best qualifications in order to be a judge so I would say we need to look at the pool more creatively um, even if we're saying there are not enough women QCs to be appointed yeah that's really true that's statistically true um, but uh, not well it's not 100% true there are sort of a lot of women QCs that could be appointed but that's a subjective assessment on my part. Um, but we do need to extend the pool in this and realise that um, how we're defining what merit is and what qualifications are is, is not a neutral language and it's something that we really need to sort of critically assess and looking at who we're continuing to exclude when we formulate those definitions. Um, the point on data is really interesting, um, particularly like in a European context. So I know in some jurisdictions it's actually illegal to collect data on race. Um, so in France, for instance, you just cannot collect that statistical data. I would say that that, that, that legal prohibition is not um, in existence in Australia and that for the more normative reason of the um, intrusive aspect that this may have for judicial officers, well, data is always anonymised. Um, it's harder to anonymise when you look at higher courts, so for example a court of seven. But if we want to see an overall picture, and why, like what they do in the UK is that you can anonymise it to a certain extent um, and you can say overall, so we could say something like superior courts have this level of breakdown. So doing anonymous surveys with members of larger, larger pools so that you anonymity, can, anonymity um, can be preserved to a greater extent but not a total extent. And the answer to that, uh, that it won't be preserved to a total extent, is that judicial office is a public office and there are certain things that go beyond the um, um, sensib sensibilities of the individual appointees and go to the greater good of trying to see courts as a public resource and a public institution and therefore this might actually be something that is part of the job. Um, and, and something that we need to know. Um, Cheryl's point actually on this one that can be, sort of links into sort of the, the same sort of, I guess, sensitivities around talking about certain issues and not talking about certain issues. So you saw from my statistics, South Africa's really good at collecting data on these kind of things. The reason why South Africa is really good at collecting data on these kind of things is because it has a really recent example of how horribly wrong things can go if we don't attack issues of exclusion um, and of a particularly racial um, discrimination and hierarchies. So when I was talking to my interviewees, I did find that the South Africans generally, not, not all of them, but most of them, had more of a fluency in, in discussions about diversity and the need for diversity or the awareness of diversity. Um, I found that my Australian judges were actually probably the least aware of it. Um, and it's not necessarily because Australia has great statistics on this issue, but it's what I would term and others have termed as the no problem problem. Um, because we have three women out of seven on the High Court of Australia, people think that the problem is solved without looking at the bigger picture and the bigger sort of statistical patterning um, of this. Um, my um, UK judges, because I did interview people outside of England and Wales on this one, so I did have interview Scottish and Northern Irish judges. So um, the, um, the UK fell somewhere in the middle. Um, I think that in the UK at the moment, 
um, the issue is becoming to, it, it's becoming so extreme um, with the continual lack of women's representation in the judiciary that, that people are starting to wise up to it and saying, you know, this is, it is embarrassing now. It is embarrassing that Lady Hale sits there all on her own in the Supreme Court, still sits there all on her own in the Supreme Court. Um, this actually sort of also goes into comments you made about quotas. And I could give a whole presentation on quotas. And quotas are, um, are not the answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and not the answer to every problem. Um, but I was specifically looking at quotas in the UK context. And so quotas might be useful where the political um, and small p political process or will has failed and it might need to have a little bit of a push along, um, but not in every context. And there are many things that you try before you try quotas. And I think that in um, England and Wales, at least, there have been many things that have been tried. Um, and we're not getting very far. Um, the final point, the final question was, um, you know, how far can we go? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and especially if you define diversity in this sort of very sort of postmodernist way of, well, I started out by looking at the status grounds, but, you know, diversity of, you know, what movies do you like or, you know, <laughs> how tall are you or whatnot, you know, and obviously that's not what you're talking about, but there are so many ways that we can sort of disaggregate people and does everybody then get to be on a court that may have 12 people? Impossible to do. Um, so this is why I start with gender. I say that we need to get better. It will never be perfect, and it won't necessarily need to be perfect because judges aren't there representatively, but they're there reflectively. And so at the moment you can say, well, you know, if we've got this big problem, well, let's start looking at who is the most excluded. Um, and then when you get into that intersectional point, and so yes, then you can't get a woman that intersects with every different intersectional identity category, but we need to stay aware and alive to this issue. Because otherwise, um, as someone phrased it in the UK, we just get posh white women replacing posh white men. And how does that expand the experiential pool that we have? So my answer to that question is, well, we can do more than we are now. And um, whether or not we need, the, the question is not whether we need everything there, but the question is we need to do better. We need to do really better, a, a lot better. Any more questions? I have one so far. I have three. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I really like the, um, uh, your paper, so thank you very much, and your argument. And it links very well, I think, with the previous argument, which I also liked very much um, in the previous paper. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding, um, I guess I didn't think about it, why diversity should not be pursued in the judiciary and how, why homogeneity would be seen as... Um, uh, a, a, a better. It, it seems that in the room there is a reluctance to accept diversity in terms of um, kind of racial terms or in terms of um, um, gender terms in in the judiciary. Certainly, um, this is the tide when it comes to international. The tide is moving towards accepting that there is no blind public spheres. Um, or rather, that public spheres cannot be blind of these issues, race, um, um, religion, and, um, and, and gender. So far, there hasn't been a lot of talk about class, only in the caste kind of um, system. But so far, um, you know, they don't, um, at least international bodies have not talked about class. Um, and, and definitely international law is very clear. It's not a direction. It's a clear, legal, binding um, obligation of states who have signed um, the UN Convention Against Racial Discrimination, and the US is among the states, and Australia as well, and ratified it. And also the, um, the um, UN Declaration on um, uh, Non-Discrimination um, uh, against women, and both of these instruments, legally binding treaties, uh, are very clear what, that when there is a need in the public sphere, then there should be positive measures. Now, I don't know whether these measures should go up to quotas, but there should be positive measures. Um, and, and actually, just very quickly, the US actually said to the committee that um, we recognize that, yes, we are allowed to take positive measures if need be. It's just that we don't think that um, um, we need to take positive measures. And the committee specifically said, no, 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 this is not what the um, convention says. The convention says that if there is a need, you're obliged to 
to take positive measures. So when we're talking about positive measures in the police um, and uh, in the um, higher education, I don't understand what's so different and why judiciary should be considered completely um, different. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really powerful. And, and I, I would like to ask you about um, how, how to avoid uh, essentializing difference uh, in a way, because I, I, I would say that you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't say that uh, there is a single female perspective, actually you haven't said that, but uh, quite the contrary. But then the, the issue is, uh, well, um, if we think about the women that might get to these uh, higher courts, probably they are very similar in terms of their life experiences to the men who also uh, got there. Um, so. Uh, uh, that leads me to, uh, to, to the question about then uh, what sources of difference uh, or, or, or different viewpoints we value in terms of judicial reasoning and whether you need to complement your account with some sort of account of uh, disadvantage, structural inequality, previous discrimination or, or, or not. I mean, or whether you can uh, have a normative value for certain kinds of diversity uh, within the judicial re reasoning without uh, taking into account that previous uh, structural inequality in society. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Aida. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your illuminating presentation. Um, I have just one... All women agree. Yes. <laughs> No, I, I have just one maybe provocative question because you were um, making a comparison between UK judges and South African judges concerning their awareness of the need for diversity. And um, do you think that maybe UK judges are not really aware of this need for diversity as South African judges are because of the different powers, the apex courts, have in the UK and in South Africa, as well as in Australia, meaning uh, the, the role that the Constitutional Court is playing in South Africa compared with the role that the UK Supreme Court is playing. Um, I mean, do you think that diversity could be a sort of a response to the counter-majoritarian difficulty of courts, of judges? Uh, since they're, of course, they're not representatives of the people, uh, maybe this sort of diversity um, is a sort of answer of a response to the objection that they're not legitimate. So it's an answer to their ask for legitimacy and uh, confidence and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mia. Anybody else? I, I have two comments, uh, and one of them at least implies or at least uh, does uh, request an answer. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I was impressed by the fact that you have chosen equality of justice as perhaps the main uh, uh, argument supporting diversity in the judiciary. Uh, and, and yet I wonder, are there, or have you uh, thought of, of, of employing also objective criteria of assessment of the improved quality of justice because of diversity in judiciary, other than the subjective assessment of one's own experience. I think this might be uh, important in order to detach the, the outcome from a two-personal uh, uh, two approach. Secondly, uh, and here I I make reference to what uh, uh, Alexandra has just mentioned about positive measures. Uh, it seems to me that uh, if you read the yearly report, which evaluates the progress which is made after the very first uh, report was issued on diversity in the judiciary, uh, it seems to me that the emphasis is now on the willingness of a younger members of the profession, on women and members of the minority, to somehow say, hi, here I am. I'm willing to go into the judiciary. In other words, it seems that it is shifting the initiative 
from the political institutions that are to make the appointment to the prospective app appointees that uh, sort of uh, try to uh, get out of the number of professionals precisely with the purpose of being uh, appointed. Now, doesn't it, doesn't it approach something like a judicial career in the sense that as Simone mentioned this morning, rather than having an exam, you still have an initial choice by the prospective uh, uh, appointees. And that would be quite innovative in a Comolo system, wouldn't it? Thank you. Right, well, I'll try and see if I can remember all of those, all, all that was in there. I might start um, uh, the last question first. And judicial careers. So one of the recommend, once again, we need to you know, I'm going to have to talk jurisdiction specific on this. Um, and the argument, well, it's the willingness of younger women and um, black Asian ethnic minority groups, um, you know, to go into the judiciary. I really hate those kind of arguments. It's kind of like blame the victim. Um, you know, it's saying, and it kind of alludes to, well, the space is open for you. Why aren't you taking it? Um, which I think is not helpful and I think is sometimes used as... Um, uh, as an excuse rather than actually a motivation. But, yes, there is still need to um, make it clear to people and that, that these positions are, are open for them. Um, a new initiative that's just been put in place um, in England and Wales um, has seen um, a type of um, judicial boot camps, for lack of a better word, um, where, and it's only open to women, people from who self-identify as from um, a, a lower socioeconomic background, a lower class background, and black, Asian, ethnic minority groups. And they can go and do a six month, or they can apply to do some a period of training um, within the high court. And the idea of this is to give, and they're particularly targeting at people um, who may not have had um, sat as a recorder, so a very sort of lower um, judicial or preparatory judicial office in the UK. Um, so particularly academics or people from solicitor's practice, um, people who work in NGO sectors in, uh, in legal services uh, or in-house legal services and whatnot. Um, and so trying to say, well, you know, come in, see if you like the job for a little bit, see if you feel that this is for you, come to these sort of, you know, shadowing process um, and we'll give you some experience so that by, the, by the time that the high court, next high court round of appointments happen, um, you'll be in a more competitive situation. So you'll be able to sort of cure um, any lack of advocacy or sort of judicial training that other candidates might have. Um, so, I mean, that, that's like a new initiative that's happening at the moment. Um, and judicial careers, I mean, that was one of the report, one of the recommendations of the Feynman and Monaghan report, was that in the UK what we're seeing, and there are larger numbers of women sitting in the tribunal services, um, but the tribunal services are not seen as a preparatory step for then, um, you know, the, the more superior courts. And so what the, one of the recommendations was that these should actually be seen as, you know, a progressive step leading up to... Um, into a more career-style judiciary. Um, the yeah, the quality of justice and so the methodology question. So methodology was something I spent probably about 18 months working out how to do the methodology in this project. And I came to the um, realisation that I needed to do qualitative interviews because the problem was complex and it involved human interaction, human perceptions, and that we're never going to get a clinical sort of this is what women do in the, to the substance of justice. I cannot think of how we would measure that. The way some people have tried to measure that is by looking at the outcome of the case. But I think that methodology is inherently flawed because it essentializes women to a greater extent. It doesn't look at the contribution that diversity has in this collaborative area. So, you know, a perspective may be raised but then may be counted and so I mean, um, using sort of Cass Sunstein's work on groupthink, and it has the ability of having different perspectives to stop this polarisation happening. So it may not impact upon the actual outcome, but it, it may impact upon the discussions, and that's still an important, um, important contribution. You also see, I mean, common law systems um, have the glory of having cons um, concurring decisions. Um, so you can have, you know, can you join the majority, you can concur, or you can dissent. There's a lovely example of this by Lady Justice Arden, where she concurred in a case, and it was involving um, IVF um, treatment and the access of a woman to um, a gamut that had been produced um, 
and the male contributor didn't want her, the woman to be able to access this biological matter anymore, and so the court went to the decision went to court, and the court had to decide. Um, and um, Lady Justice Arden wrote a concurring decision that actually rejected the woman's claim, but she said, you know, I want the social narrative. You know, well, she didn't actually say this, but you know. She said, you know, I want it to be reflected that I understand this, you know, the importance of the woman's claim to have the right to be a biological mother. I think a lot of weight needs to be given to that argument. You know, it won't be determinative of this claim, but that argument needs to come out into the public dialogue. So that is a contribution that can't mathematically be sort of put into outcomes or whatnot, but um, it's, still, it's still important. So the methodology question in this area is really essential. Um, and, and, important. Um, what were some of the other questions? Um, UK judges not as aware. Um, well, I mean, it depends on which UK judges you're talking about. Um, Baroness Hale is acutely aware of the need for diversity um, in the UK judiciary. Um, and um, whether there is something about the constitutional court that um, means it might be more important for that court to have diversity than it would be for, say, the UK Supreme Court, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I mean, particularly if you... And even for the High Court of Australia, it doesn't sort of... Um, it is not sort of charged with applying human rights legislation or, or whatnot. I mean, it still is making important public decisions that impact upon all areas of public life. And there is still assessment going into you know, migration decisions, um, family law decisions or whatnot, or you know, public law decisions that, that you know, it, it's not just the realm of a constitutional court that we need diversity in, if that answers your question. Um, Essentializing difference. Sorry, I, I can't. I didn't quite get the crux of your question. If you, since well, this is like a common criticism. Criticism by having women uh, in courts, you won't uh, necessarily get that. Um, um, women to th those women to argue from that perspective necessarily since that doesn't yeah. exist. But there is another uh, a second point here that I wanted to make, and actually it's how or how do you go about deciding which perspective perspectives would have value from the pers yeah. from uh, in light of the quality of the decision because that's your kind of uh, normative framework, right? That difference uh, advances the quality of the decision or different perspectives. So the question there is, um, what would be the basis to decide which perspectives are valuable from, yeah. uh, I mean, if you want to advance the quality of the decision at the end, it's... Yeah. Yeah. What my argument is, is that I don't want to take a normative stance on which perspectives you need. Um, I want to say that we need as many perspectives as possible feeding into this process. So in the marketplace of ideas that is occurring when judges decide, I want there to be as much friction as possible. I want there to be as, very, as great a variation as you can possibly find around those ideas. Um, and so that the judges then, when they're having to decide this, will hopefully by reason, by looking and bouncing the ideas off each other, by considering these alternative perspectives, which, yes, can be provided by counsel um, when arguing the case, but we all, you know, there's a lot of research that's being done on the impact of the behind the scenes, you know, collaborative discussions and the impact that that has on decision making. So I would not preference a particular perspective. You know, as a feminist, I would love to say, you know, oh, they should all be feminist judges, of course, because that's, you know, clearly the most desirable um, perspective out there. But that doesn't actually sit with this argument of diversity. And so if you go back to Kathy Alberton's quote that I put up at the beginning, and it's about having the greatest variation of perspectives, um, you know, at, at play so they can bounce off. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It was, again, very interesting. Let me just tell you that don't believe when they tell you that on the continent judges are the mouthpiece of the law. Yeah. Because that's absolutely not true. I sort of And they also engage in interpreting the law, by all means. Yeah. Okay, now last but not the, the least, certainly, John Morrison from Queen's University, Belfast. I apologize for the wrong spelling of your last name. Yes, and I read, uh, I think, 15 times the whole, uh, the, the, the off prints, but then uh, it just went through. And uh, I think it is quite interesting because 
Your presentation not only ends the discussion of this morning, but to some extent also paves the way for the focus that we're going to have in the afternoon. So you're anticipating already okay, what great. will take place in the afternoon. So okay. you have the floor. I'll do my best. Um, thanks very much uh, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to Jens and to Roberto. Like everyone who's returned or come for the first time to Trento, I have been charmed, thoroughly charmed by your welcome and by the uh, way in which you've looked after us and by the interesting session that we've had to date. I hope I can maybe say a few words to help us move along. What I want to do is talk a little bit about the, the judicial role in transitioning societies generally and in the UK before focusing a bit more on the Northern Ireland experience where the task of how to create a new, judi a new judiciary that can be both reflective or at least representative for the new post-conflict society there presented itself. In doing so, I'm going to consider Northern Ireland as a special, as a, as a new legal space that's been conditioned by some of the wider developments in judicial politics in the UK more generally, but also has its own particular dynamic. When we think about how to renew the judiciary there, focus comes to bear for me on the pervasive idea of the role of, the pervasive idea of merit and its role in making appointments. And how despite other intentions, judges and indeed the wider legal profession often have a disproportionate role in determining what merit is. And in doing this, I'm going to draw upon some empirical work that I carried out when I was a member of the Judicial Appointments Commission in Northern Ireland. I have to state a conflict of interest there. I served two terms, eight years, on the Judicial Appointments Commission in Northern Ireland. Anything I say is, of course, in my own personal capacity. It was a great fun. I've got lots of war stories, but uh, maybe we'll move on to those later. The case study of Northern Ireland, I think, is, is interesting in terms of the general themes of this uh, session. And perhaps I'll return to some of these general themes along with a few ideas about how we might re-engineer the judiciary to work better. OK, judges in transitional societies. I don't think this audience needs any reminding of the importance of judges, their role, both positive and negative, in transitions in South America, uh, South Africa, Central and Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe and beyond. I was reading a piece called Difficult but Ultimately Rewarding Lessons from Transitional Justice in Latin America. And that uh, was a quite an interesting analysis of how the um, dictator Pinochet, as we call him, had uh, his success was based on the fact that he didn't just take over the military. He also, he, he also um, uh, didn't just take over the military, the, the, the senator for life type role but he was very sedulous in his control of the judiciary. And the same piece goes on to talk about how, in contrast, in Uruguay, creative lawyers, creative judges, in fact, were able to link the, uh, the, um, the, the role of the former dictator there, uh, Bordaberry, to the assassination of two Uruguayan legislators uh, in the Operation Condor, um, uh, um, human rights abuse that took place there, and eventually, uh, secure a conviction for the dictator Bordaberry. One of my colleagues who works a lot on, on, on um, legal culture more generally uh, points to the, the importance which judges have in a, in a sense in setting the tone for a wider legal culture, a culture of, of reform, a culture of questioning. Often the social movement literature concentrates around the role that lawyers sometimes have in maybe narrowing the focus of other struggles to a particularly legalistic form but if lawyers are properly engaged, if, if judges are open to legal strategies, it seems there's a particular importance in that. You can see that both in the legacy of the civil rights movement in the UK and to a lesser extent in how law has been used strategically in the courts and during the transformation uh, that was involved in the peace process in Northern Ireland. So judges clearly centrally involved in these things. And we need a, a particular example. We can consider Tunisia. Uh, at the moment, Tunisia, just last month, judges were put very much in a, in a position of conflict between the new constitution, a judges' council, which is supposed to be consulted about the appointment of the judges there, and the fact that there's a whole series of international instruments which have been uh, incorporated in Tunisia, which are very much contrary to some of the, the trends there, particularly around gender 
uh, equality, migrant rights, freedom of expression, and so forth. So judges are right at the center of that transition in that jurisdiction. Okay. In Northern Ireland, I think there is a new legal space in post-ceasefire, the post-ceasefire world. I think we can talk about the wider constitutional changes consequent on the Belfast Agreement, the uh, Northern Ireland Act, and so forth, which have opened up significant changes and new possibilities for the legal system. This is, I think, a new legal space. Um, in part, I suppose you could say, you could say a lot more about that, but I think in part it comes about by the final step, if you like, in the peace process. The final formal step in the peace process is the devolution of justice. This is something which took place via the, the, the uh, Justice Act 2010, which led to the devolution of all justice functions to Northern Ireland. Before it was thought that justice was too, too difficult an issue for local politicians to be involved with. The fear that you could have former ex-combatants, for example, in charge of the courts, the police, the prison service, was thought to be too scary. However, it's been finally decided that this was a possibility, this was, this was something which, which we could live with. So the complete, the completion of devolution has involved the domestication of the legal, of the justice system. This slide is meant to illustrate how many of the key figures are now locally based. It's also meant to illustrate, this is a rather difficult point, it's also meant to illustrate how, in fact, looking at these personalities, uh, it's locally known, no one else would know this, it's locally known that these are from the nationalist side of the house. Previously, uh, the Lord Chief Justice um, would have been, uh, had always been a unionist, Protestant unionist. Uh, the police uh, are, are, are a different class, a more professional class, the DPP and so on, the Attorney General are all from the other side of the house. Also, there's some interesting um, stuff about the iconography of justice. Uh, it's important that the Royal Courts of Justice idea is still there. The, the, there is still the same insignia. However, for example, there are certain customs and rules about the display of, of um, flags and portraits of the Queen and so forth, which are more sensitively handled. There's also the question of the uh, oath of loyalty. There have been a series of rather interesting cases. A number of, of people who were being appointed as QCs, Queen's Counsel, had refused, national, from a nationalist background, had refused to take the oath, the oath of loyalty to the Queen. And in a judgment, it was decided that they didn't need to do that anymore, they could simply affirm. So in a sense, is that there's a, is a, is there are structural changes, the domestication of legal, um, of all, a whole range of, of kind of legal um, um, services and so forth, but also a, 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 more, a more intangible but important cultural change. Okay, so against that background, why judicial appointments in Northern Ireland, why are they so important? Well, in a rather ignored report which contributed to the um, post-agreement uh, landscape, there was a review of criminal justice, and it made the point that in a post-conflict society, the role of the judiciary is particularly important. There's no question about its role in terms of uh, dealing with a, a legal landscape where very often ordinary issues, which you might consider in the normal society are, 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 are routine, about schooling, for example, or about access to housing. These are constitutional issues. They're highly politicized issues. And the judiciary are involved in deciding these. Um, there's a sense also in which the agreement itself produced uh, a lot of constitutional litigation. I was involved in a project which looked at how the Northern Ireland tr transition involved, to a large extent, those who are in an, in an enforced coalition using the courts to carry on the conflicts, which previously had been carried on uh, by proxy uh, on the streets, as it were. So the courts were involved in a whole series of constitutional cases, talking about the limits and, and, and the role of the, of the agreement. Um, Um, also, I suppose we can think about how Northern Ireland, the, the, the peace process there, fits into an idea of, of transitional constitutionalism more widely. The idea of traditional constitutionalism being something which is um, 
forward-looking uh, to some extent, but also uh, aimed at undoing the problems of the past. Uh, this notion of the boundary between ordinary politics and constitutional politics being blurred, which is a feature of transitional justice, is of course a feature of, of Northern Ireland. And we can think about ways in which judges perhaps are involved in a different sort of role, using their power not to block democracy, but to make it more deliberative, as Sunstein would have it, or perhaps to do what, as Carl Clare talks about in the South African context, that uh, in devise a transformative constitutionalism. Or we can even think about ideas of things like democratic experimentalism. Dorf and Sable talk about that, the idea of judges working with other constitutional actors to develop a new kind of future. We can think about all of those in the Northern Ireland context. And that all, I think, puts the emphasis very strongly on the importance of judges having a particular role. Beyond that, the debate itself is based Sorry, the, the peace process itself is firmly rooted in a new rights and equality framework. So judges are involved in determining the limits, the nature, and so on of equality. Equality not in a, in a, in a narrow sense, but there are a whole range of different equalities um, through um, sex, gender, um, marital status, uh, race, um, sexuality, uh, dependence, and so forth. It's a, 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 quite a developed equality structure, and the judges are clearly involved in trying to, to, to negotiate that in what is often rather a, a traditional uh, social um, society, social context. So what's the answer to all this problem? How are we going to get good judges? Well, the answer was to, to, to develop this Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission, on which I served. Uh, this, of course, was uh, in part to a recognition that the Northern Ireland situation was different, but it was also, I think, part of the wider uh, UK context. I won't say too much about that, but we've seen how the UK uh, has um, uh, more generally had, has had to develop uh, three judicial appointments boards to meet the new circumstances there. And in particular, uh, the focus has come upon this search for diversity. And I'm putting up that great quote from um, Lady Hale, judicially described as male pale and stale, which is a good one. Okay, what's the problem in Northern Ireland? I was going to ask you to guess, but I put the answer up. Oh, I haven't actually. I said it's not religion. The problem was not religion, oddly enough. You might have expected it to have been that the courts were staffed by the dominant, in inverted commas, the unionist tradition. But it wasn't the problem. What do you think the problem was? Class, yes. And? Social class, yes. And, and? Women, women, of course, women. It's a feature, I think, of all transitional societies that women end up, yes, it was male dominated. It was male dominated, very strongly male dominated. We had trouble on the commission getting statistics. It was a, one of our first big battles because uh, they hadn't measured this before and we had great difficulty getting statistics. This is, we, we did find out where not, well, it's only slightly surprisingly, anecdotally, it was felt that the legal system had run on a fairly equal basis in terms of religion. Um, but we discovered very quickly that there was a huge disparity between uh, men, the appointment of men and women in the upper levels of the court structure. At the, at the tribunal level, it was pretty okay, considering the applicant pool. But in the higher courts, the high court, and indeed the county court, uh, it was very strongly male. In fact, uh, the number of um, high court judges is a little bit uncertain. It's around about 12, sometimes 14, with a few acting people in. Number of women in the high court in Northern Ireland? Zero. Zero. So, there are a number of county courts, the next level down, um, uh, judges, but not very many. Also, I suppose there were complaints made that solicitors, the other branch of the profession, were underrepresented, that uh, lawyers working in the public sector and in the community sector were underrepresented and so forth. And of course, the issue which I think is perhaps most interesting of all, or equally interesting to the gender issue, is the class issue. Uh, we were unable to get statistics on class, but there was a, a very clear notion that, that the judiciary in particular uh, was, um, is, uh, 
drawn from one particular social class. Now, it seems to me that a lot of these issues focus on the notion of merit. Appointment on merit has been the supreme governing principle in the UK generally, in Northern Ireland in particular. It was a way in which the whole idea of a Judicial Appointments Commission was sold. They will be appointing on merit. Don't, don't worry, they'll be appointing on merit. The old system was known as the tap on the shoulder, the idea that the Lord Chancellor would know who was ready to be a judge and would tap them on the shoulder. It's your turn, brothers, off you go. You're on the bench. Um, but this idea of merit has emerged to stop, to, to make sure that the, the professions aren't too frightened. But merit is, is there, it's, it's, it reflects international best practice. I could talk a little bit more about how it's in a whole series of international declarations of how all the jurisdictions in the UK have put it into statute form. The Republic of Ireland has, has a new merit system which is going to go into statute and so forth. It's, it's all there. But it seems to me interesting that this initial near universal support for an idea of merit has begun to fracture. Even among the legal profession, who required merit to buy these commissions at all, it's become a little bit more problematic. Let's just look very quickly at four views of merit. And I draw your attention, by the way, to the uh, sartorial point of the braces. Uh, very important, the suspenders, as Americans will call them. Uh, it seems to be necessary if you're going to be a senior legal figure to, to have good... Uh, Brenda Hales managed without, but everybody else seems to have braces. Anyway, um, top left is Lord Sumption, who's a colourful uh, new appointment to the Supreme Court. He was, he was um, Roman Abramovich's uh, attorney, and he delayed his, his appointment to the Supreme Court so he could finish off his million pound brief for uh, Roman Abramovich. Um, he says in a, in a notorious lecture, I think uh, it's fair to say, uh, he said that the, uh, the, the pool for the appointment of judges, he said, is dominated by white males. And some, some said that's an important issue relating to, 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 to merit. He said, appointment of merit is necessary. We have to make it attractive for people to, to, to join the bench. So we can't change the idea of appointment on merit. And he says, well, if we have that, it'll take at least 50 years to achieve even a reasonably diverse judiciary. So it seems from presumption, merit, for whatever reason, lies with white males. It's just the way it is. The other chap, Lord Hacking, with the striped braces, uh, is a leading practitioner. And he takes issue with merit, and in particular, how it's been measured by these judicial appointments commissions. He says that lay commissioners in particular, I was one, cannot possibly have the benefit of knowing and having worked closely with applicants for years and years and years. It's demeaning for judges to have to go and sit exams and answer questions. Humiliating, he said. Two formal interviews, humiliating. We all know who the chaps are and so forth, and to make them do this is outrageous. Merit for him is something that is clear and demonstrable, but only to those in the know, those who are already in the legal profession. As a counter to this, of course, we have Lady Hale, who suggested, uh, and I'll quote, as some of us have always known, it's not enough to get the appointments process right, although that is hard enough. We have to get the definition and assessment of merit right too, and that is much harder. Now, Lady Hale points to the definition of merit as being important, but doesn't really go much further about saying what it is. Jack Straw, who was a former Lord Chancellor and Minister of Justice, he in the, the red braces, he takes issue directly with Sumption's idea that merit and diversity are in some way mutually opposed to each other. Uh, and he talks about how merit is an empty vessel. It can be, it can be filled with whatever you like, but needs filling carefully or else it can all too easily mean people like us. Straw continues that appointing on merit does not necessarily mean that the most meritorious will be appointed, the best candidates will be appointed. There are all sorts of reasons why that wouldn't be the case. Perhaps the best candidates aren't applying. Perhaps something's going wrong in the process. But also, this is important, he says, it may be because merit is wrongly defined. Straw derides the idea of there being some universal idea of merit which is easily recognisable. Some notion of a league table of brilliance where you can put everybody into their allotted place. Uh, this is something I would support very strongly. However, Straw then for me spoils it by saying, well, actually, if you have a tie-break situation where you have equally meritorious 
candidate and one's a woman, you can appoint her. I think he should stick to his main point, which is saying merit isn't something which you can just grade like an examination. It doesn't quite work like that. So this idea about merit, I think, not only reveals the centrality of this concept to the whole judicial appointments process and how it's a lightning rod for a whole variety of other concerns. I think it, the, the insight from Jack Straw and Lady Hale perhaps resonates very strongly with the idea of merit which I uncovered in some research which I did looking at uh, merit in Northern Ireland. I did this initially as a member of the commission and then when I quit I did it as an academic. It was slightly dodgy doing it anyway, I did it anyway. Uh, this research looked at what merit's supposed to be and what it in fact is. There were several bits to it. There was a survey bit, a, a quantitative bit, but the most interesting bit, I think, was the um, idea of, a, of, of exploring merit from a, a focus group point of view. We, asked, we just asked a whole series of practitioners in particular, not judges. I felt uh, we were interested in practitioner views of merit, what they thought merit was and what they felt merit should be. Some interesting ideas emerged here. First point was, what do you think should be seen as merit? In an ideal system, what should be seen as merit? And this was a much wider construction, you might imagine. It wasn't simply, oh, being good at law. It was much wider than that. It involved that, yes, there was law, technical, legal skills, but also notions of empathy and judgment were put forward. Um, the sorts of soft skills which you might expect. And importantly, this was seen as transferable from a wide range of different areas of life. And of course, the view was that there were clearly meritorious women out there. They just weren't being appointed. We then explored a bit more about what is, what is seen as merit in the system. How does the system itself see merit? And here it was a much narrower construct. It was related to ideas of age and experience, particular career paths. It was clearly gender skewed. And the result was that the gene pool of talent, as it was put, is very limited. Merit tended to mean, for example, that uh, applicants would be barristers with a mixed high-end practice. Um, criminal law was often mentioned as something that was required. High-value chancery work was something which was, which was, which was felt to be important. Uh, an applicant's workload should mainly be in the high court with occasional visits to the court of appeal and it, the Supreme Court of Strasbourg would be better for the higher points, and for the higher courts and so forth. As one barrister pointed out, how else do you demonstrate merit except if you can do the more difficult cases? So merit was clearly bar focused. Barristers rather than public uh, lawyers, uh, lawyers working in the public sector, in the vice sector or in, in solicitor's practices. It was also very strongly focused on advocacy. As one barrister put it, our skills are as advocates. If you've cross-examined witnesses on a day and daily basis, this is the appropriate skill for a judge. Well, to put it simply, the most successful practitioners are the most successful judges. They have demonstrated that they get on, they know the law, they get on with colleagues, and if females have got on despite the obstacles, then they too must have merit. Obviously an open-minded chap. Merit is also linked very strongly to seniority. There's a whole series of statutory requirements, usually around the fact you have to be a member of the legal profession in one form or another for six years, eight years, nine years. Uh, most of our respondents felt there was no point applying unless you had at least 15 years of experience. Um, uh, we need the very best people who have dealt with high value cases, been to the Court of Appeal, Strasbourg, dealt with difficult and complex cases, and only if you've done this are you really good enough to demonstrate the sorts of skills needed for the High Court? This, in a way, reflected an idea we had from an earlier piece of research commissioned in the first years of the uh, Judicial Appointments Commission, that there was a pecking order. The profession saw a pecking order amongst its, its uh, members, who was ready next, who was seen to be the next person ready for the bench. Uh, for example, we were told there would have been quite a bit of disapproval if Mr X hadn't got it. There are appointments that are seen as surprising because the bar know how these people perform in court, but the Judicial Appointments Commission can't. Outside bodies can't be alive to this pecking order. Uh, it was felt you had to be a QC, you had to have particular sorts of practice, you had to have jumped various hurdles. There are a whole series of lists that you can get on, um, you know, 
the Attorney General's list who are able to represent government in certain ways and so forth. Um, and there's a whole range of issues raised by this focus on seniority. Why do you have to be uh, over 55? Compare that, for example, to other professions where it's felt that maybe you're more active at a younger age. Merit, our respondents told us, was also seen as male, in part because women have less chance to do the work that is seen as meritorious. Uh, the view ex was expressed that women are shuffled off into family law and can't do those sort of high value, high profile cases. The phrase emerged, I'm sorry for the phrase, chick law. Chick law, it's a horrible phrase. Uh, uh, it was used by a male barrister, I'm afraid, saying it, chick law. Yeah. It was felt that by many people that, that family law, that, that social security law involved rather complex matters of both law and fact, where you could demonstrate skills, but that wasn't what counted. Uh, if you have criminal practice, that's the gold standard. Family law experience is not what is wanted. The vast majority of those barristers and solicitors who practice criminal law are male, and there you are. Female merit was seen to be something slightly different and something that maybe wasn't transferable to the same uh, extent as male uh, merit. Uh, as one female member of a focus group said, the requirement to succeed is that you must think just like a man, you must act like a man, be as good as a man. So these wider factors also contribute to this. There are uh, sexist briefing practices. Barristers are briefed by solicitors who very often reflect the wider legal culture where a good man is seen as the person that you want. Uh, women are less able to access the informal networks. Uh, one woman told us, men can stay on here, the bar library, and then go home to a cooked dinner, the kids in bed, and straight, to the, straight into the study. They can hang around here, do their work in the library, networking in an, in an informal way. They can run into someone in the survey or on the stairs and get work passed on. Uh, women talked about the difficulties of managing careers and families. Uh, as one female barrister put it, I've watched my male peers at the bar advance far beyond me. They have good wives at home. Um, this view is changing perhaps, but at a very slow space, at a very slow pace. Uh, a view we got represented by one woman who said, yeah, women are adopting to a male way of succeeding, but the system, the way of succeeding needs to change. The research also found that merit was policed by judges, both formally, there are consultees, they have a kind of uh, rule where they have to write references. So if you're not visible, if you're working in an area which is not visible, if you're not in the high court, you're not noticed, no one knows who you are, they don't, don't know who this person is, we used to get references, they never heard of her. Uh, that sort of reference, whereas if it was a chap who was well known, it was different. Um, that was sometimes uh, reflected in some of the hostility that there was to us as lay commissioners. How would you know what they're like? You, you don't know anything about legal practice. The view came across that the judges were still in control despite all these legal appointments commissions. It was still a tap on the shoulder. Those on the bench see the skills, this is a barrister, senior barrister, those on the skills, those on the bench see the skill sets they bring as being the ones that are needed. It's an advocacy set, skill set by and large. Judges have the view that the profile we, barristers, have represents what a good judge is. So many people saw the existing judiciary playing an undue role in determining appointments. Uh, there was talk about the high court, the judges having a, a role in, in blackballing appointments. My own experience was that it was far from true, but there were arguments uh, about that. I don't have time to go into them. Think a little bit more about judicial, about career pathways. This is something that's closely related to merit. The question is, are there different routes? You can take either formal routes or informal routes that make you more likely to be a barrister. A senior lawyer from the public sector made the point that a judicial pathway is the key thing. I work in a sector where there are some extremely capable women but have no perception of the possibility of being a part-time judge, for example. There are these informal and formal pathways. Um, you get to be, uh, on, as I said before, on various lists. You get to appear in various sorts of cases and so on. Uh, one interview told us 
It's funny how irrespective of the existence of NIJAC, there are certain truths that are self-evident. Senior Crown Counsel will become a judge. If you have access to the right sort of work, if you're known on the back corridor, that's the bit where the judge's offices all open out onto, if you're Treasury Counsel, if your father was a judge, Another informant said, a successful candidate is someone who may well have been vocal in the Bar Council. Uh, served on it in a very high profile, someone would have heard, everyone would have heard of them. Attendance at dinners, at lectures and so forth was thought to be important. Crucially, you know the judges. You know the judges. Women reported themselves as much less likely to network and much less willing to ask judges for support. Uh, I suppose some of this points to the fact that the wider legal profession is responsible, not necessarily only the appointments process. The wider legal profession is male-dominated, both the bar and solicitors. The career paths of women and men in the professions differ. Women are shunted off to low-profile, often low-status work, uh, unless they're prepared to perform, as the women say themselves, like a man. So the gene pool, the notion of advancement within the profession to get females applicants in a position where they're ready to apply, ready to show that sort of merit can be clearly seen. Okay, I better move along. What other solutions? Well, one solution, I suppose, is that you could tinker around with the uh, um, appointments process. I personally think, after eight years serving on NIJAC, that the Judicial Appointments Commissions are neither the problem nor the solution. However, of course, they will be blamed. Of course, they'll be blamed. But I don't think they're the problem. I think, in a way, the problem is this notion of merit. I think we need to rethink fundamentally how merit is defined. As one barrister told us, the law does not know just how much it has to change. There is a meritocracy, but it's their meritocracy. That's a fact of life. That was chilling. That was something that really changed how I thought about this piece of work. It was really important. I think, paradoxically, that discussions of merit need to be moved beyond gender precisely in order to achieve the sort of gender balance that's appropriate for a modern judiciary seeking the most talented judges. If we allow the current view of merit to remain unchallenged and see the problem only about moving more women or more ethnic minorities or whatever, into this definition, the change will be very slow if it happens at all. I think uh, merit is something which really needs to be, to be looked at more closely. And I think when you're doing that, you don't necessarily look at what the legal profession say. A critical read-through of what the legal profession said showed that perhaps, and I have to say this is a view I, I'm getting increasingly, the closer I got involved with the, with the whole legal process, the more I took the view that for many people, the legal process is about serving the convenience of lawyers. And it's, this is very often seen in the notion of merit that currently exists. It's about making a system that, which works well for lawyers. It seems to me that we perhaps need to think a bit more about what the judicial system's for. How can a diverse judiciary improve the, the judicial system? How could it make it better, fairer, cheaper, more responsive to public need. If you read the responses, uh, even of the women uh, respondents, they're complaining that they don't fit into this view of merit. No one is talking about the fact, for example, that in Northern Ireland, again, I have to declare an interest here, I'm on the body which dishes out the money, or supervises the dishing out of money. There's a fund, there's a fund for um, public litigation in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a society of about 1.6 million people. We spend in pounds sterling per week. It offer a prize. Anybody who will get the get the figure right. How much would we spend on public public law, lawyers in private practice, giving them public money for a population of 1.6 million people? Just under two million pounds per week. Two million pounds per week. The most generous and the highest funded public legal service in the known world, in the known universe. <laughs> um, again, I'm speaking here purely privately, I have to say, with no reflection on the legal services agency on which I, I serve. Um, 
So it seems to me that there's a, there's, a, there's a big job to do. And I think the job, the first way of dealing with this job, I'm done. The first way of dealing with this job is, is to actually look at what judges actually do rather than what applicants for these posts do. What's the user of the court system want from judges that they might not currently be getting? What skill sets are needed for the judicial task? What role do judges have in ensuring effective case management and teamwork to deliver justice? How can they avoid having full formal hearings? How can they actually deliver justice in a cheap, efficient, fair way? How does the judicial process, or its perception, um, what is it, how does it help to have judges who are more reflective of the broader community? Really think about those issues and re-engineer our notion of merit. It seems to me that's the only way forward. That's all I've got. Thank you very much indeed, as it has been an excellent uh, last uh, paper in the morning, for the morning session. And as a matter of fact, I like very much this idea of re-engineering. It seems that some of the challenges that uh, we have to face require exactly some sort of activity of re-engineering as well as some sort of a, a giving more content to this notion of merit, which is so central, but which may be the object of quite a wide manipulation according to who is uh, to evaluate what the merit is. Uh, because of the time, uh, I think that, I mean, on purpose, I let John speak a little longer because then I thought that we would have only one round of questions. I don't want to stop anybody from asking questions, as we'll just have one round rather than two or three questions at a time, so that he will be able to give perhaps uh, uh, answers taking into account all the uh, points that have been raised. And Fred Ehman is the first one. Please, the microphone. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. I really appreciated the paper. And um, uh, it's just a, a, one of the things that struck me um, in my own work on just the American side was that the nature of selection process didn't uh, produce outcomes significantly different. And I thought merit, uh, and your paper is very illuminating on why maybe merit uh, wasn't going to be uh, a major game breaker in terms of producing outcomes. Uh, but quite apart from the re-engineering of the, uh, the fundamental point you make, which I think is terrific, um, oh, I, I wonder whether um, the, the whole, the way you put it, the, the idea of getting a tap on the shoulder or uh, the nod, uh, another uh, thing. Uh, I wonder how uh, transparent the application process is. I say this because um, what I sense or what I see a little bit of, and this is maybe, maybe, the, maybe there's more that meets the eye or less than meets the eye, is that this combination of a pecking order of, of the nod, um, and in our system, at least in many merit selection systems, the transparency of the application process is such that a lot of people don't want to go public with the fact that they want to be in that pool because they know about the pecking order, and they know that they're going to run up against uh, opposition. They may not get the job. They're thinking, I probably won't. And, and so in an odd way, especially for an administrative lawyer, I'm thinking, this is too much transparency. <laughs> that sometimes, you know, if, if there were less, so that uh, people could quietly say, yes, I'm interested, but let's not tell the world yet until, you know. But, you know, all these little subtleties uh, play into the system in such a way that I think, as you rightly uh, point out, you, you end up back at the status quo, uh, even though uh, you, one would think you would be opening up uh, things. Anyway, more of a comment, but... Uh, Marco Dani? Any more? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I found um, challenging your uh, idea of re-engineering the notion of merit in this uh, specific field. Uh, although, perhaps because I'm personally becoming increasingly skeptical about the notion of merit in general. Um, I find that it would be perhaps 
more important, rather than re-engineering the notion, finding a way to hold accountable those taking decisions. So rather than finding a formula which is able to factor in a very complex equation a number of variables, allowing genuinely power, political power or administrative power to those taking the decision, but finding <coughs> sorry, institutions and formula to hold them accountable for the decision they have taken after a certain period of time. Would it be a productive way to approach the problem? Jens? Yeah, very briefly, I was uh, very much struck by the fact that you made this opening on the post-conflict situation. Um, and then what you said in the second part was, from my point of view, and, and I see this as, as positive, probably, uh, <laughs> much detached from a post-conflict situation as we would imagine the Northern Ireland conflict uh, to have been, uh, not having been there, of course, ourselves and have lived this experience. So my uh, point is, um, well, there was another very delicate area, which is policing in Northern Ireland and the organization and the reorganization of the police service, which is, of course, different. There is a link with law enforcement and so on. I won't uh, drag on too long. Uh, so the, the, the question is, can, are there some kind of lessons learned uh, or so, uh, strong differences which might have also influenced uh, what you have said about the sector of the judiciary? have two more, Gracie Pelacani and then Aida Torres, and then you have. My question is somehow linked to Jens' question, because I, I was very impressed at the beginning when you said that um, religion is not the problem, because when you said that gender and class is, are the problem, so it came out to my mind that, I mean, this is religion, <laughs> or if you do not intend, uh, we do not intend the religion, how much you practice how much times you go to the church on Sundays, that you intend religion on social values, how you are raised in your family, how gender relations are explained to you, uh, to what schools uh, you go. I mean, this is religion. So, um, and, and maybe this can help to, to address the problem and then to find better solutions. Thank you. So you were looking for a definition of marriage, and now you had to give a definition of religion. One more. <laughs> you thought life was easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, th thank you so much. Um, you have shown how like uh, criteria of merit that are traditionally presented as objective actually work to the disadvantage of women. And I think that a clear example is the one of seniority, that it, apparently it's uh, objective, but in practice, uh, it disadvantages women. So, uh, when you propose to rethink uh, the criteria of merit, would, would you try to uh, find objective criteria too, but different, or would you introduce gender um, as, as an explicit element in the way you frame those criteria? Um, yeah. <laughs> Plenty. Oh, one more. I'm sorry. Yeah, Professor Saunders. Quick one. Um, thanks very much, John. Um, in broadening the conception of merit to um, decouple it to some extent from practical experience, um, in your experience, does that then have flow-on consequences? Um, one of the reasons I asked that question is we once had a Chief Justice of Australia who said, we will have to deepen the pool at some stage, but that will have consequences for for example, the training of judges. Uh, if we appoint academics, that's fine. There are some really great academics, but they, they will need to somehow get some training in trial experience so that they can deal effectively with what's going on in court. Uh, and there may be other flow-on consequences that, that you can think of. It. So, so the, the, the re-engineering of merit really involves the re-engineering of the judiciary much more broadly. All right, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's your, all yours now. That's a great question. Ask the question. <laughs> most, of the, most of the are unanswerable, I'm afraid, but I'll do my best. Um, I like the idea of re-engineering more generally. I like, I like the idea of re-engineering merit because it seems to me, and we thought of this as a commission, all kinds of stuff about you know, offering judge shadowing and you know, Mr. 
programs and you know trying to ensure the short list was and all sorts of stuff. No matter what you did, it made relatively little difference. So I, I'm for re-engineering of merit. Um, Fred's question or remarks about the transparency of the process. Yes, you're absolutely spot on. We we had we were we got involved in an arms race uh, of different methods of assessment of candidates because as soon as we had a range of questions, there were people who uh, set themselves up in business to advise um, to advise applicants on how to answer the questions. So we had, for example. Uh, elements of a written question, a, a desk clearing exercise, a whole range of quite imaginative role plays and so forth. And a big problem was we had to, like, like, a, like a French farce, we had to arrange that the candidates didn't see each other. Because if they did, the word would get out, oh, Mr. X is applying for the bench, his work dried up, certain solicitor, oh, they're not serious, we'll not go to them and so forth. So there are severe consequences. And of course, the idea of the temerity of, you know, Mrs. Y going for an appointment would circle around the, the um, small world very, very quickly. So that's a real problem, absolutely right. Um, Marco's point about accountability for those who take the decisions, this was a really important issue and it's one we had to deal with quite, quite um, full on in the terms of the Commission. Before justice was devolved, the Commission still operated and we had a big row about whether or not we were merely a recommending body and whether or not the Lord Chancellor would have the final authority to make the appointment which we resisted very, very strongly indeed with the support of the Lord Chief Justice. And uh, we um, won that battle. Then when power was devolved, the notion of accountability came back as it reasonably would. But let's pause for a moment and think, who is it we'd be accountable to? To our local assembly? To the DUP? To Sinn Féin? Uh, we felt that they would politicize the whole process concern would be less on accountability and more on politicizing the process. You would have turnabout. You had a unionist judge last time, we're having a nationalist judge this time, and so forth. So for various technical reasons, perhaps to do with the conflict, we've sort of avoided that otherwise quite a sensible approach to things. Um, Jens, on post-conflict, um, the idea of maybe learning from the police, you're absolutely right, the police were a very good example of how you can fundamentally restructure an organisation. The old Royal Ulster Constabulary was replaced by the Police Service of Northern Ireland, which is, a, I have to say, in fairness, an international exemplar of human rights-based policing. Um, it was also, there was a quota system, one of the very few times when a quota was actually allowed, was actually in, in, um, enacted in legislation, so that members of the nationalist community were appointed uh, first in order to reach the 50-50 uh, level. The problem with the, with the judiciary is at the same time as some people wanted it changed, some people resisted very strongly the idea that there was something wrong with it. So if you'd moved, if you'd said we need to reorganize this completely, you would have lost those largely unionist people who felt, and not only unionists, who felt that the system had worked pretty well under severe strain. So if you said uh, we have to re reorder it completely, you would have lost them. So it's rather typically of most peace processes, is an ambiguity there. We have to change it, but we have to keep it the same kind of thing. So for that reason, I think that, that sort of approach was, was, was avoided. The question about religion. I have to say that in, in Northern Ireland, religion is really just a cipher for political belief. It really means nationalism as opposed to unionism. So it hasn't quite got the same flavor. It has certain elements to do with social policy, family policy, but oddly enough, the, the extremes on both sides tend to agree on that agenda, but disagree fundamentally on the political agenda, i.e. the self-determination question. Um, so that, that's a slightly different question. Um, oh, the seniority, uh, the question about seniority is a good one, about um, make an explicit element in the um, process to, to do with gender. We, yeah, we were very interested in that. I had a a very forceful colleague who she and I tried to make it a, a, one of the tests. We had to develop these tests for judges. And we toyed with the idea of saying, one of the tests is you have to get two children on a double buggy onto a bus with 10 pounds to buy food to feed a family for two days on. <laughs> but we couldn't sell that one, unfortunately. But yes, it would have been fun to have had tests like that. Um, I suppose we could say, and this is people have thought about this before, make one of the criteria for the job to, to, to be female, but it's kind of difficult. You know, you can do that in 
all sorts of interesting ways. In the university, when we want more women professors, we say we want uh, someone who's got a particular interest in gender and the law. You'd be surprised how many men turn up with a profound interest in gender and the law as it applies in trusts or whatever, you know. Um, Cheryl's comment about the consequences of decoupling marriage. You're absolutely right, yes. It would require a, a, a more fundamental change, particularly to do with training. One of the questions that we had from people was always rather plaintive at the end. They'd say, can I ask, what sort of training will I get to, to be a judge? And we had to say, well, you get I, you know, a day with the, uh, <laughs> that's your lot. So it was, it was uh, training is needed anyway. So yeah, I mean, it would be a chance to bring in things they, they certainly ought to have. So yes. Thank you all for the questions very much. Very good. I think it's always a good sign when we are late because of the lively discussion. So this was uh, another great session. Uh, I'll ask you to, to join me in applauding the speakers and the participants <laughs> at, the end of, at the end of the session. Uh, from the experience yesterday, I think that one hour is enough. So we should, we have now 55, in fact we have 65 minutes. So we meet at 2.30 with five minutes of flexibility. Thank you and enjoy lunch. <laughs>